my friend Todd, KR1W, sent in this nice little plastic case for us to take a look at. There are some goodies lurking in here. Let's take a look. This is the OGS 50 watt HF power ampli amplify. Amplify? You're missing an R. But that's all right. We've come to expect that from our friends overseas. And it has XT60s to power poles on it. It looks like, uh, looks like Todd put the power poles on there for me. That's fantastic. So now we need to gather some adapters and some cables and some fun stuff and a radio. Of course, the radio of choice is going to be the X6100, but this will just as easily work with almost any other radio that's out there that is five watts or less. What kind of ham are you if you don't have a big batch of cable adapters? From the DX Commander, I need a BNC adapter. This will go on to the antenna out side. Power. BNC jumper goes to RF in, and then it goes to RF out. Power pole magic working. We have the red light on there. I'm gonna go ahead and plug in the microphone. And you know what else we need? We need some type of way to tell how much power we're getting out. So we will use the MFJ 849. And now we gotta recable all this madness. <laughs> We have the gang all assembled. We're going to start out on 160 meters. We have the X6100 going into the OGS 50W HF power amplify, which then goes into the MFJ 849 power meter and then into the dummy load that's just sitting here off camera. So we're not going to interfere with anybody. We're just going to try and see what kind of power we can get out of this. Five watts out on the X6100. gets us 30.8 it's changed to 80 meters 35 60 meters 32 40 meters 33.7 30 meters 33.3 20 meters 18 to 20 I saw there, 17, 36, 21 megahertz, 20, 24 megahertz. <laughs> Didn't do so hot on there. We, we doubled our power. We went from 5 to, to 9.8. 28, 28. Same thing. There is a relay inside of this guy that clicks on when there's RF going through the line. And then clicks off when you're done. And I am in straight key mode on my paddle. It doesn't switch off fast enough for full break in, which is nice because you don't want to hear this clackety clackety clack. So you can see on the oscilloscope here. It clicks in fairly fast, it clicks out a little slower. So I think that's working pretty well for that purpose. And it seems like the lower bands are more efficient. Until you blow a fuse somewhere. Ah, uh, the OGS 50W HF Power Amplify. I guess if they couldn't put the R on, that might have been some problems. I don't know. But now, when I plug this thing in to the workbench power supply, the power supply goes off. And everything else works fine without plugging this thing in. So, let's take it apart, see what's going on. So this amp has two screws on here, which leads me to believe that that is heat sinking for the, the final transistor that's in here, the amplifier transistor that's in here. So we're just gonna take the top of the case off and see what's in here. And those two screws connect to those two transistors. Those two transistors happen to be IRF30N or ERF30. <laughs> those are the, uh, the power amplifier transistors. OGS 50W version 2.0 BD7 OGS 
is the call sign of the ham that made it 08 2022. So not that old in the grand scheme of things. It was made directly these this front this back and front panel are both uh, PCB material and so the BNC connectors are grounded to the the PCB material and then they're also grounded to the circuit board that goes in there. There's some half moon cutouts below. There is a fan that is wired to positive and then a black wire that goes underneath and back up to the board here. So maybe there's a little bit of a switch there. There is not a whole heck of a lot going on inside of here. So why, oh why, is it shutting my power supply off? The power wires are barely connected to the XT60 connector. See three to two on the binocular toroid there. So I wonder why it is shorting out. Let's see if it is just a short. All right, we've got it in, we've got the multimeter in beeper mode, so we can hear that just off camera. There we go. So let's do black to black, red to red. There is a short across the power. So we were happy there for a hot minute and then we weren't happy there for a hot minute and I'm not sure why. That is interesting though. The LED on the front panel that gives you your green light go is actually a circuit board part. So there's a resistor that goes out there and then ground returns through the screws. All right, dead short at the circuit board. Okay, more research is necessary. What I'm gonna do is start removing parts and see where that leads us. I'm gonna take this fan off, which is directly connected to the power supply. I'm pretty sure it's not the fan that's shorted here. Okay, fan is done. Are we still shorted? Of course we're still shorted. Okay, let's put that back on since that wasn't the culprit. And that is just horrible. Whatever they did soldering this together. Oh my. I bet they're using lead-free solder, but that's a mess. Yuck. Okay, now let's pull the ground connection off of the circuit board. We gotta, we gotta pull one of them off, so why not that one? And this should free it up. Yep. So the problem is not the connector. Let's check positive and negative here. Okay, so what is the next logical thing? I'm gonna pull the negative connector off for the fan as well. Did not think that was it, but need to be sure. Remove the heat sink. There's a little insulator there too. It's gonna to be very important to note that there's an insulator there. All right, let's desolder this resistor. This is the resistor for the power status LED on the front. And that will enable us to take the front cover off, which should enable us to slide the circuit board out of the rear. Actually, we probably didn't need to take that off at all, but the damage is done. It's off now. And just for grins, did that fix anything? I doubt it. Nope, did not fix anything. I need to unscrew this rear panel from the case, but the circuit board is soldered to it, so it should all come out. Interesting, there's some stuff underneath the circuit board there. Oh, uh, I guess it's a temperature probe for the fan. So yes, that was a temperature probe for the fan and there's nothing accessible from the bottom. So I could have done all of this from the top and you can see there is a plastic insulation bit there and there's another plastic insulation bit there. 
So I'm gonna put some fresh heat shrink compound, heat shrink compound, heat sink compound down. And this stuff does like to get everywhere. And yes, that is a lot. But that's okay. Because I have the technology to clean it up. Okay, folks, this amplifier has been a an interesting project. It was it was $75 worth of fun. That's what these things sell for on eBay is about $75. However, it was not $75 worth of amplifier. That's where the story gets really interesting. You saw in the video, it was working great until that moment when it wasn't. And then it became a repair project. Then it became a very involved repair project. The best we can tell is that the binocular toroid, the power amplifier inside the unit was wired a little too tightly or a little too poorly constructed from the factory or whatever the case may be. And that's what caused the FETs to overheat, the, the IRF 530Ns. That's what caused that thing to go short circuit. I removed one that was bad and replaced it and it did come back to life, but it didn't amplify anymore. So I looked at a couple of other parts inside. I removed the 7805 that was in there and put that back on after checking it out. It was fine. This thing looks like it has recycled solder. I didn't even know that was a thing. I was talking to my Elmer and he's like, yep, it looks like it's got some recycled solder. I don't know why they did that, but I was having trouble, as you saw in the video, the solder inside was, was kind of crap. Continued to, to dig a little deeper, checked out some different connections, checked out some different things inside. And really, it was, it's just a mess, for lack of any better terminology whatsoever. I reached out to my Elmer and he was able to dig around inside. Basically, he redid all of the connections, which is a lot of work for a $75 amp. We replaced the 530s again. There is another bad 530 here in the bag that I'm gonna send back to Todd as a souvenir. It does not work anymore. What I suggest is stay away from this thing. There are a couple of other videos on YouTube as well talking about how wonderful this device is. Wonderful. Because it's, they're not talking about how wonderful it is. There are a couple of problems with this. It has an RF sensing relay and circuit built in so that when you send a signal through it, it trips a relay and then connects the amplifier in circuit through to the antenna. And then when you stop sending a signal to it, it trips the relay and disconnects the amplifier circuit so that you can receive. There is a very, very small amount of time, a very small window when your radio is transmitting into a very high SWR load. What my Elmer was able to do was take this and add in a parallel resistor circuit so that when you are in that scenario, the radio never sees more than two to one SWR. It should have been built in in the first place. There is no bandpass filter circuitry inside of this kit. Whatever the signal comes in, clean, dirty, whatever, is the signal that gets amplified and then sent out. So if your radio is really close to having some harmonics in the first place, now those harmonics are amplified. So it's up to you to make sure that that doesn't happen. This is not a kit, this comes as a complete unit and it is not FCC certified, probably another reason why the price is as low as it is. It is your responsibility as a responsible ham to make sure that this thing is clean and operating properly on all the bands that you get it on and there's no way to tell without getting some external piece of equipment in order to do that. So again, that adds more to the cost. There will be links to the equipment that I used in this video in the description down below. Like I said, they do sell these on eBay for $75. They also sell a kit form of this not the same manufacturer. The design of this amplifier is actually a very old design that you can find. If you just search for IRF 530 HF amplifier, you will find designs and schematics and parts lists and everything in order to build one of your own. And then you can build in some of the protection circuitry. There are a couple of other amplifiers out there that are in this price range that are better suited. The MXP50M is a good one. The Micro PA50 is uh, one I hear is pretty good as well. And I will leave links to those in the description as well. If you ran into one of these and you have had problems with it, leave me a comment down below. Let me know what your thoughts are on this device. This looks like it was put together the same way that the ATU100 was put together. Uh, by somebody who didn't understand what they were doing. They were just building things out of instructions on an assembly line, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but some people get better training than other people do. It's always a gamble when you take a look at something like this for $75 for an HF amplifier. Take it as a sign. There is a video right over here I think you will enjoy next. Thanks for being awesome. I'll see you over there.